What's good, everyone? Welcome to the Truth Podcast. I am your host, yes, Anthony Benitez, and I want to welcome every single listener from Belgium to Iran, the Persian Gulf Coast, specifically Bahrain. What's up, guys? Shout out to everyone recently in Japan, in Germany, in France, Poland, uh, Australia recently. What's up? Man, what an awesome time it has been. And today's going to be an awesome episode. Man, I was studying uh, earlier today and it was just like, it. you guys ever read the Bible or listen to a sermon and you're not trying to be spiritual or anything like that? You're not trying to like uh, be mystical, but something just kind of clicks and you have this like umph, this fire, this desire. I, I, don't, I don't like to call it fire because religious people call it fire, but like this desire, it's like a sweet, sweet desire, sweet, sweet disposition. That's a great song. Sweet disposition from the Lord. And it's, it's just, it's, it can't be shaken off. Today, I want to talk to you guys about something that is, it's going to be a little bit of a tough pill to swallow, I would say, but it's going to be very great. It's going to be a great blessing. It's going to make you strong. You know, it's like eating spinach. You guys ever watch Popeye? He, he pops open the can of spinach and his freaking muscles are so jacked. It's like, it's great. So in the same exact thing, this is like sauteed spinach, which I like sauteed spinach. But this is going to be good for us as we grow in the Lord. And not only that, you guys ready? This is why it's going to help you so much. It's going to help you so much because you are going to learn to discern, to decipher the difference between new age and Christ, between religion, between the law and a Christ-centered sermon. It's so important. Why? Because it's so subtle. Deception would not be deception if it's just outright like, boo, here I am. Deception is so strong because it's so subtle. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, that the enemy took on the form of a snake. The Bible calls the snake the most subtle, the most wise and subtle animals of them all. Like a slithering snake, it's very, 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 very subtle. It's not like, a, you know, I said this in the past. We think Antichrist is those who are wearing, you know, all black, black nails, which I used to paint my nails black. I like wearing all black at times. So there's nothing wrong with that. We think that that, and that's so superficial. We think that that is Antichrist. But in reality, Antichrist, anti means against or in place of. So in place of Christ, instead of his amazing grace, we call it discipline. Instead of his amazing grace, we call it hard work. Instead of his amazing plate, his amazing grace, we call it seed time and harvest. You get what you deserve. Instead of his favor, we call it sharpening our skills. Instead of his wisdom, we call it philosophy. We call it, you know, 10 steps how to whatever. I don't want to say any books because I don't want to offend people, but I'm going to offend people no matter what. How to be great. How to win friends. How to influence people. How to get rich. How to live a healthy lifestyle. How to have a great marriage. All these things. It's like, okay, we realize that the source of life, the Bible says in Colossians, when Christ who is our life, if the source of our life is Christ, and he is the provider for all of these things that we want to succeed in. Christ is for success. Christ is for prosperity. Realize that. Christ is for health, wealth, riches, success, prosperity. You, he, he's, he's there to give you favor, to have influence with people. He is there to help you win friends. He is there to have a great marriage. He is there so you have a a great healthy body. He is there so you can have wisdom at work for your career. He is there for all these things. But what happens is that when we take him out, because the Bible says when he is when when Christ who is our life, when we take him out, 
and we try to get these blessings outside of the finished work of the cross, that's anti in place of Christ. And I want to kind of open your eyes and peel it back by the Spirit of God today and show you this very subtle, slimy, deceptive sermons, messages, books. Because we think New Age is, I mean, if you guys didn't know Drea, before the Lord saved her, she was into a lot of this New Age stuff. So we, and it is New Age. When we think about New Age, we think, you know, the onyx stone and that is new age we think of tarot cards and that is new age we think of all these things but uh, even i think you know what i think is more dangerous than tarot cards and crystals i think it's more dangerous when we preach rules and regulations than tarot cards and crystals because tarot cards and crystals it, it's it's outright you know you're tapping into your inner child it, it obviously that's new age can we agree yes but i think an even greater more subtle new age is when we take the position i was talking to ethan about this earlier this week and he said you got to say this on the platform so i'm gonna look for it when we take the position of christ and we try to make the blessings happen we try to bless ourselves we try to be the source of life we try to use our own fleshly wisdom to gain a b and c isn't that crazy let me look for that text all right so the text that i sent ethan is this listen People make themselves Christ to depend on themselves for the gift of prosperity, health, winning friends, success, etc. So whenever we take the position or the, we take the place of Christ to get anything outside of the finished work of the cross, that's anti-Christ, that's new age, that's depending on self, you know. I hear, I hear and I see titles like unlock human potential. There is no human potential. If there was human potential, then why would Christ come and die for humanity if there was potential humanity? I see messages like all these things. And I'm unveiling this today so you and I can have wisdom and not fall into these traps. So I want to go to the scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19 says this, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, that's Paul, Sylvanus, and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. So what did he just say? He said, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached by us, that's Paul by the Spirit in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul is saying by the Spirit of God, he's saying, I preach Jesus Christ. Sylvanus teach Jesus Christ. Timotheus preached and taught Jesus Christ. And Apollos, who was a protege from Paul, the apostle, he preached and he taught Jesus Christ. Furthermore, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 2 says, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23 says this, But we preach Christ crucified. But we preach Christ crucified. So, Paul, who wrote 75 to 80 percent of the New Testament, the Bible says that he, and not only him, but his son in the faith, Silvanus, Timotheus, Apollos, all these great men of God who were ministers of Christ, who were taught by Paul, these great men of God, they all preached Jesus Christ. Paul said, but I determined to know nothing. That's very, very, very subtling. He determined to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. Then... He says, for I preached among you Jesus Christ and him alone, his cross alone, Jesus alone, and him alone. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12 through 19. You can read it for yourself. Why am I saying this? Because the centrality of Christ the, in the New Testament, you see, the, in the Old Testament, we preach rules and regulations. We preach how-tos. We preach do-nots. We preach do's. We preach the knowledge of good and evil. Why? 
because the Bible says that was the intention of the Old Testament was to condemn, was to bring you to death because humanity is so strong in their in themselves that only the ministry of death can unveil and reveal their necessity for the person of Christ. So in the, under the New Testament, Paul said, I determined to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. He says, me, Timothy, and Silvanus, we preach the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Then he said, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. You can say to the religious people, Christ crucified is a stumbling block. Why? Think about that. Why to the religious people... Because these are two categories that he said in 1 Corinthians. Paul, by the Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, But we preach Christ crucified. Then he says two categories of people. You ready? Number one is the religious people, which is categorized by the Jews. Number two is the Greeks, which is the, um, the people who are hyped on intelligence. This is New Age. This is people, the philosophers, the debaters, the, those who seek to, you know, of great minds, quote unquote, all these things. So in one area, Paul said, I preach Christ crucified. I, de I determined to know nothing except Christ crucified and his cross alone. That's it. And he says to the religious people, to the Jews, it's a stumbling block. Why? Why to the religious people is Christ crucified a stumbling block? The Bible calls Jesus as our righteousness a stumbling block to the Jews in Romans chapter 11. Not only to the Jews, but to every religious person, Jesus and his cross, Jesus being our righteousness, Jesus being our holiness, Jesus being our success. The Bible says Jesus is our wisdom. Jesus is a stumbling block to the religious people. Why? Because to the religious people, you see, the Greeks... This is a category of, quote unquote, the great minds. They're not trying to do anything to get the blessing of God. Instead, the great minds, you know, subcategory, they don't try to get the blessing of God. Instead, they become the they try to take the place of God and get the blessing of influence, winning friends, uh, success, money, intelligence on their own. So that's to the Greeks. That's why the Bible says Christ crucified to the Greeks is foolishness because the quote unquote great minds, which is new age, they go after their own. They become their own God. They figure out regulations, rules, do's and don'ts, a higher self, a inner child without all, all these things, a subconscious mind uh, unlocking inner potential. What they are saying is that I don't need God. And the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's in Romans. So instead of trying to bless or please God, the quote unquote great minds, the Greeks, they call Christ crucified foolishness. Why? Because they take the place of Christ or attempt to to get their own things. They tap into a higher self, which is which is just the evil demonic spirit. They try to find their inner self, subconscious, the all these things, the ten steps, um, you know, discipline. You know, the the success and prosperous man has an extra hour and a half of of work a day. All these things is antichrist. But the Bible says to the Jews, which is a category of religious people. It Christ crucified, he is a stumbling block. Why? Because the religious people try to do something to get the blessings of God. But Jesus is a stumbling block. Why? Because he himself has done it all so that we just simply, without works, receive everything by grace. That is offensive and a stumbling block to the religious people. And that is foolishness to the quote-unquote great minds of the day. But Paul said, nonetheless, I still preach Christ crucified. Nonetheless, I still determine to know nothing except Christ and Him crucified. Nonetheless, he says, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, 
who was preached among you by us, by me, Salvanus, and Timotheus. Jesus Christ was preached among you by us. To the religious people, yeah, it's offensive. It's a stumbling block because they try to do works to get something from God. To the Greeks, the great minds, sure, it's foolishness because they themselves have made themselves God and tap into these demonic wisdom and powers to make themselves a God, a deity in their own life. So why am I saying this stuff? Because you might say, yes, I get it, Anthony. But in reality, like I said, deception would not be deception unless it's so subtle. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul, by the Spirit of God, said this. He said, in the same exact way that Eve was deceived by the serpent, I am afraid that your minds would be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So the name of the game is deception. The name of the game really is mixture. The name of the game is deception and it is mixture. Personally, it is my full conviction that you cannot mix. You, there's no way in hell you can tell me that you're listening to us, to Pastor Prince or any other person who's preaching Christ and him crucified and then go on your merry way and then listen for an hour about how to blank, blank, blank. Do's and don'ts, regulations, holiness. To preach morality is the law. So there's no way you can tell me that you're listening to all these things and then listening to us and it will become effective in your life. In fact, listening to that garbage, listening to that law will nullify the grace of God. That's, in, that's, that's called Galatianism. That's found in Galatians. Are you guys still okay? Remember I said that today's going to be like a like spinach for your muscles. That's the problem with Galatianism, with the with the church in, Gal in Galatia, was that they were mixing. They were mixing. So it's like you listening to Christ and him crucified, but still relying on your good works to get the blessings of God. Still putting your trust on the regulations, the do's, the don'ts, all these things. You cannot mix I used to believe that you can eat the seeds, eat the meat and spit out the bones, eat the watermelon, eat the fruit and spit out the seeds. But I don't believe that. This, this is my full conviction. I'm not saying for you to go out and make a YouTube and defame people. But I am saying as mature children of God, realize that. Personally, if, if you if the Lord has brought you to me, then then obviously the Lord is witnessing certain certain truths in your life, certain truths that I speak on. And it is my conviction that you cannot mix. It is my conviction that you cannot. There's no way in hell. There's a little a little bit of poison. It's, it's just a little bit of crap, a little bit of poop in the water, a little bit of drugs, a little bit of poison, just a little bit of poison. You, you know, Anthony, I work out, I eat well, but at the end of the day, you know. I just take a shot of poison or I just, you know, I just inject poison. Just it's just a little bit, though. I just inject a little bit of poison on my fingertip. It's foolish. You, you cannot tell me. And I'm here to tell you that when we remove the stone, which is the law, when you remove the veil, Second Corinthians says when but we with an unveiled face. Behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, we are transformed. Could it be the lack of transformation comes because we still have some veil on our face? One more time. If the Bible says, but we with an unveiled face, in context, what is it talking about? What is the veil? The veil in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that that is talking about, the entire chapter brought up the name Moses three times talked about the law written on stones more than once, that veil in context is talking about the law. Any dogmatic law, any rules, any morality, any how-tos, any do's and don'ts, that is the law. So the Bible says the key to transformation is to have an unveiled face and to look at Jesus in a mirror. 
the key to transformation, according to that scripture, is to have an unveiled face and to behold Jesus and him alone as in a mirror. Could it be that, that the lack of transformation in our lives is because we still have veils on our face? Is because we're still mixing? Because we're still trusting in the flesh? And we're not beholding Jesus as in a mirror? Could it be? Because that's, that's what the scripture says. Do you believe the Bible, listener? I hope so. Do you believe the word of God? The Bible says, for all flesh is as grass. And it will pass away, it will wither away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Do you believe that the word of God is incorruptible? Do you believe that the word of God is the truth? Do you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? I do believe that, Anthony. Then the Bible says, but we, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are transformed from glory to glory by the Spirit of God. So why am I saying this? Because I'm, I'm for your transformation. I am for your success. I am for your prosperity. I am for your blessings. I am for your wisdom. I am for whatever you want in life. What do you want in life? Do you, do you want great friends, great relationships, lots of money, lots of houses? Anthony, that's unimportant. Okay, then I'm sorry. You can find another platform. But these things is what the Lord has brought to help and to, to bless us with. Great, a great relationship, great children, great friends, great money, great health, great peace, great wealth, great success. Why? To glorify Christ. So when people look at your life and they say, wow, what magnificence, what beauty, what success, what humility, what great testimony of the finished work of the cross of Christ would that be for you? There is no nobility in poverty. There is no nobility in being broke and a failure. Because you have to understand, in the book of Proverbs, the Bible literally says that there is a poor man who has lots of wisdom, but no one will listen to him. Why? Because he is poor. Anthony, I find that offensive. I just quoted you a scripture. This is found in the book of Proverbs, that there is a poor man with lots of wisdom, but because he is poor, the Bible says even the poor man is hated by his friends. And the poor man, no one listens to the poor man. Why? Because even though he has all this wisdom, no one listens to him. So you can't tell, this is my belief, This is because that's what the word of God says. You cannot tell me that you are looking at the, at the beauty of Christ and you cannot be transformed. It's impossible not to be transformed. Not by your effort, but by the Spirit of God, the Bible says. So my objective for today is to remove the, the veil completely. Because what's happening is that we're mixing far too many things in our, our eyesight. We're, we're Instead of beholding Christ alone, we look away and we look to self. Instead of beholding Christ alone, we look away and out of curiosity... I was talking to Declan about this. I'm sure he wouldn't mind if I put him on blast for this. He was like, you know what? I was hanging out with him yesterday. And he was like, you know, I was on Instagram. And I don't know why these Muslim um, reels keep popping up. And I said, why don't you block them? And he said, oh, that's a good idea. I said, because what's happening is that that's still the law, no matter what. I said, I'm, gonna, I'm like, even if you're looking at it out of curiosity, that's still mixing. And though you're looking at it and reading through the comments and you're and you're listening to these rules of religion for that specific religion, you're just looking at you're looking at it right out of curiosity, right? But the Bible says when you look at something, you are transformed into it. So by you still you you're still tapping into the law, and you're mixing the finished work of the cross with laws, do's, don'ts, and regulations. Even though they don't apply to you, you're still dipping into the law. It's more detrimental to your life to listen to law and morality being preached than watching than watching i'm sorry this is going to offend than watching an r-rated movie it's it's far worse to listen to law being preached it's far worse to listening to do's and don'ts and morality and the knowledge of good and evil being preached than lit than watching an r-rated movie in faith because you think it's funny 
Why? Because the Bible calls the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One gives you life, one will kill you. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is not the tree of sin. It's the tree of morality. It's the tree of do's, don'ts, and regulations. That will kill you. But if you're listening to rock music, which I do often, if you're if you're doing whatever you whatever you feel alive to do in faith, that will actually bring you life. You will feel you you will feel free. You will feel life flowing through your veins because you're not condemned. But then you're listening to a snake in a suit or a snake in flip flops or whatever it is, whatever attire he or she may have. You're listening to that. And that will kill you. That will produce death because that's what the scripture says. The Bible says that the, the law is the ministry of death, the ministry of condemnation. You know what minister and ministry means? To minister, it means to serve. So if I go to, let's say, one of my favorite restaurants in L.A. and I ask for steak and eggs and the waiter comes and he gives me, he serves me my steak and eggs. That's he's ministering. He's giving me something. So if the Bible calls the law, the regulations, the do's and don'ts, the how to's, the all these things, if the Bible, the word of God, which is incorruptible, incorruptible, says that is the ministry of death. That means it is serving you on a cold platter death for you to eat. So as a shepherd, because, you know, I, I, I get I got this. I got a great message maybe a couple of weeks ago where one of our persons who listens on the podcast loyally shout out to you, you know who you are. She was telling me how um, out of curiosity, because the, the flesh gets seduced by evil. So out of curiosity, we, we end up going into these ministries and listening, you know, from A, B and C about this, about that, do's, don'ts, how to's, do more, do less, all this crap. And what happens is that we end up getting sucked into it. So she messaged me and saying how grateful she was for for a shepherd to pull her back, even though it was a little bit painful while listening to the correction. I've, 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 Declan would tell me that I've had that message multiple times because it's like, if I'm afraid of your opinion of me, then I cannot help you. But if I just preach and I not just preach anything, but I preach grace and Jesus and him crucified, the Lord will provide for me. The Lord will witness for me. The Lord will confirm my word and the Lord gives weight to my words. Because it is God who confirms everything that comes out of my mouth. If he, if I, if I step out of line, you'll feel it. But I, I, I love the Lord. I'm not perfect, but I love Him so much that I, all I want to do is glorify His Son and His finished work. That's it. And any other ministry or death or bad habits. And when I talk about bad habits, I'm not talking about smoking cigarettes. When I say bad habits, I'm talking about listening to the law. That's a bad habit. I'd much rather you smoke a pack of cigs a day than listen to an hour of law a day. That's what I mean by bad habits. Not all these morality stuff. The Lord will help you with that. I'm not the Lord. He'll help you. So... Today's going to be of a shorter episode, but I wanted to bring this up to you. So whenever we listen to sermons or read books, whatever it may be, if it's not glorifying the finished work of, of the cross. And another thing, a lot of people can preach Jesus and preach him as a work. I've heard this many, many times. There's a ministry, I think, out in, I don't know where they're at. I'm not going to bring it up. But there's a ministry... And they preach, uh, I mean, they, they have a picture of Jesus as their logo. And um, they preach Jesus, right? So you will say, Anthony, that's good to listen to. Okay, let's pause. But what are they preaching about? If you, if someone is preaching Jesus, but they're using him as an example to, as we are here, he is there, we need to get there, we need to follow Christ and 
and be him and do this and preach the the beatitudes and all this stuff that's still the law that still works because you don't have to become friend newsflash colossians says you have been completed in christ if a work is completed what does that mean if the mona lisa was completed then and then you come in here like an like a I was going to use something else. If, be, if you come in here like a, a foolish person trying to add to the Mona Lisa, then what you're saying is the Mona Lisa is not completed. But if the artist says the Mona Lisa, it's done. He puts down the paintbrush. It's finished. It's completed. That means there's nothing left to add to it. So if someone would jump the red ropes in the museum and get a paint brush from 99 cents and just try to paint over the Mona Lisa or just add just a little bit, maybe just like, you know, maybe the eyebrow needs a little bit. I just need a little bit. You're adding to a completed work. And that's called antichrist. That's that's the law. That's works. So in the same exact manner, the Bible says we have been completed in Christ. We are complete in Christ. That's Colossians. So you're not trying to, you're not even trying to be uh, transformed into Christ. What's happening, and this is going to be for the higher class. What's happening is that you're being awakened to who you already already are. You're not trying. It's not like you're a. You're not, it's not like you're point A, and Christ is point B, and you're trying to get from A to B. No, Christ by his grace, has made you point B. And what's happening is that he's just trying to shake you up and open your eyes to realize what has happened already. You're not even trying to be transformed. You're being transformed in your mind, the way that you think. But the true transformation comes when you awake to the understanding of who you already are. So you're not trying to do to become. You're not trying to be like something. It's already happened. It's already completed. The Bible says you have been completed. You are complete in Christ. So what happens is that we try to make Christ an example, and he is an example, but we try to make him the finishing post, and we preach him as a law. We preach Jesus as a law. You need to do this. Christ was humble, Anthony. Don't you know you have to be humble? Christ was loving. You have to be loving. That's all, that's still the law. That's still the law. But instead, when you... And this is why it takes an anointing from God. This is why it takes a holy calling from God. This is why it takes great grace from God. This is why this is not a occupation, but a call. It takes a holy calling of God on your life to unveil the finished work of Jesus. And when you find someone that can unveil the finished work of the cross, you better hold on to him. That's what I do when I listen to Joseph Prince. Because it takes a holy calling ordained from God Almighty to call this person out of darkness, anoint that man or woman, and to unveil by the Holy Spirit of God the finished work of the cross of Christ. You better hold on to that person. Anybody can pre any fool can preach law. Any fool can write a book about how to A, B, and C. Any fool. The fool has said in their heart, there is no God. That's what Romans chapter 1 says. But a anointed minister has been given, gifted, not by their merit, but by election, grace to unveil Jesus and his finished work. Why? So that we as a church would be blessed. When we see the son of God in his beauty, in his glory. So I want to end with this, that the what's hindering our transformation is we still have a little bit of veil left on our face. We still are still curious about the law. Isn't that crazy? Like we would think it's like a. I mean, I hate to kind of give this illustration, but the Bible talks about it in this way. So just bear with me. Romans chapter 7, the Bible talks about Christ as our new husband and the law as our, as our old husband, which we have died to. And what happens, we see this in the natural. 
let's say you get out of an abusive relationship and then you have a nice new husband, we're still curious about the old relationship. The Bible says literally in Romans chapter 7 that we died to the old man, the old the old husband, I should say, in Romans chapter 7. The old husband was the law. And we died to that abusive old husband, which is the law, Romans chapter 7. And we were born again to be married to another, the Bible says, even to him who was raised from the dead, so that we would bring forth fruit, that's children, unto God. So when we still, that, that, that's the, the tendency of the flesh, is that we're just drawn to evil. So then what happens is that we try to go back to the old husband, of the law, of the do's, of the don'ts, of the regulations, of the how-to's. Why? It's like a it's like an, a, a person going back to their abusive ex when they've been delivered from that marriage. That's literally what the what Romans chapter seven talks about. The word of God literally has likened us before we got born again as being married to the law. And we died because according to Jewish tradition and according to the law of God, you can't get a divorce. The husband has to die or the woman has to die. This is Romans chapter 7, verse 1 through 17. So the husband has to die or the woman has to die. So the Bible says he, gave, he provided a death for you and I out of that old abusive marriage from the, from the law. So he provided the death to that old husband and we the bible says now we are alive to be married to christ to bring forth fruit unto god so now we're married to christ to bring forth fruit unto god but yet we're still cheating on him and going back to the law the old abusive relationship why out of curiosity why it's just the tendency of the flesh the children of Israel did the same exact thing when they were delivered out of Egypt. They were moaning and wailing and complaining, asking to go back into Egypt. The Bible says they were missing the garlics and all the licks from Egypt. It's a tendency of the flesh for us to, to be seduced back into the law. For us to be curious about do's and don'ts and regulations and how-to's and whatnot. So I want to end here is that everything that you listen to, whether it's on this platform, on any other platform, the Lord himself brings you into realize it must it must be Christ centered and it must not be he or she must not be preaching Christ as a work, but he or she must be ordained to preach the finished work. Notice how uh, Paul, by the by the spirit of God, says, I preach Christ crucified, Christ crucified, Christ crucified. The Bible says the cross of Christ is what I preach. So it's not preaching Jesus as a work to become, but it's preaching him crucified. Why? Because the finished work has unveiled what God has done for you through the body of Christ. And I'm telling you, friend, if you have a desire to lift up Jesus, God honors those who honor his son. God pushes away those who push away his son. I'm not talking about not being saved, but there is a gifting. There is an influence. There is a favor. There is a you can tell in different people's lives. So in the same exact way, when you and I have a desire to lift up the son of God, when you lift him up, God will lift you up. If you if you exalt the son of God, God will exalt you. David was called the man after God's own heart. I was talking to this about my wife and I'll end it here or to my wife about this. Was David perfect? Of course not. But the Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he repented quickly? No. Because he was perfect? No. The Bible says that David longed to bring the ark back into Jerusalem. The ark is a type of Jesus. So his longing was to bring the Son of God back into Jerusalem. 
if your desire is to bring the ark Jesus back into the church, God will exalt you and honor you and God likes you. God loves, I mean, God loves all of us, right? But it's like, and Prince said this, so I'm not out of line by saying this. And I agree with it. He was saying, Prince was talking about how God loves all of us, but he, you know, he likes hanging around some people, those who lift up Jesus, those who are able to receive. But if we're always sin conscious, if we're all, it's like, let's say if, if you're married, right? You love your wife, but what if your wife or you love your husband, but what if your husband's just kind of like, blah, it's like you love them, but it's like, you know, you're no fun to be around. You're not fun. You're not you're just, you know, you're just not fun to be around. And G and, and Jesus, the ark is a type of Jesus. David's desire was to bring the ark right back into Jerusalem. So God calls David a man after my own heart. The heart of God is to bring Jesus back into the church. The heart of God is to bring the ark back into Jerusalem. And David was in line with God's desire because the Bible says, David was a man after my own heart. The heart of God is Jesus. If you can open up the heart of God metaphorically, you would see Jesus. So when you love his finished work and when you are zealous to protect his finished work, God will exalt you. And not only that, but the Lord will love to just hang out with you. The Lord literally sat down with Abraham and Sarah and laughed. Had a, had, a, had a long night. And then the angels were leaving and the, and the Lord was just hanging out with Abraham. This is found in Genesis. And he was just hanging out. It's like he, it's like he didn't want to leave the presence of Abraham. And then the Lord said, should I tell Abraham what I'm going to do? Should I withhold from my friend what I'm going to do? That's what the Lord said about Abraham. It, he he whined and dined with Abraham. He was hanging out with Abraham and Sarah. He was laughing with them all night. And then as he was about to leave, he, it was almost like he was hanging out, kind of like not wanting to leave Abraham. And then he says, should I withhold from my friend what I'm about to do to Sodom and Gomorrah? Should I withhold from my friend? He calls Abraham his friend. And to be a friend of God, man, it's 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 so beautiful. So I just want to end here is that his desire is always about his son. God's full desire is to glorify Jesus and his finished work. I'm telling you this because I know the heart of God. And when we choose to get ourselves mixed right back into works, right back into the law, that grieves the Holy Spirit, not not sin because sin has been paid for. But when we are in unbelief, and to doubt is to do. To be in unbelief is to work for something that Jesus has paid for already. So what are we doing working for it? But I believe that you as a listener, you, you're growing and the Lord is helping you and the Lord is blessing you and the Lord is loving on you and the Lord is, you're, you are a friend of God. Whoever you're listening, whoever's listening, I know you are a friend of God. And I'm here to tell you that as we look to Jesus, as we make him the number one centrality of our life, it's only a matter of time before everything just starts to manifest. Just like in Jeremiah, Jeremiah, what do you see? I see the almond buds. Yes, you see, you have seen well. The time has come. Now it's time for you to speak the words that I've put in your mouth. So, with that, I will see you in the next one. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. I hope you're encouraged by it. If you believe in what we're doing and want to help us continue spreading the word about our gracious and loving Savior, consider supporting our podcast. Your contribution, whether it's a one-time gift or becoming a monthly partner, goes directly towards our media and our video production efforts. Together, we can continue to share the good news to those that need it the most. Visit our website to give today. And thank you for your generosity.